Hi, I'm Kevin Hill, and today I thought we would do a question and answer video. I like to do these from time to time. They're a lot of fun. You guys seem to enjoy them. So as always, a few days ago, I asked for your questions on Facebook and on Instagram. But I did my best to pick out a lot of questions that were asked multiple times. All right, let's get started. Oh, by the way, I was going to mention the lighting here. It's just a little different setup. My easel is right over there, so I'm looking, I'd be looking past the cameras in that direction. So it's kind of just an empty space back here. I, I kind of like it, just, I don't know, playing around with it. Maybe we'll do our question and answer, or just things that are not painting. Maybe we'll do it on this side of the room just to change it up. So let me know if you like it. I'll be looking at the comments below. On to our first question here. It's about the canvas. What kind of canvases and what quality do you use on your paintings? So that's a good question because <laughs> painting really does start with a canvas and the different canvases can give you slightly different effects. I, I like to use Sunbelt canvases and they're made in Texas. They have a website, I think Sunbelt Manufacturing, but the better thing to do would be actually to call them on the phone and ask them to stretch the canvases extra tight like Kevin's because it, it makes a difference. Um, the, the regular ones are a little too floppy. When they're, when they're super tight and crisp and your brush just, it, it doesn't bounce, it doesn't flop too much, really, ooh, they're nice. Now, I'm not sponsored, I'm not paid by them. Uh, they don't even send me free canvases. I actually buy them and I love them. So that tells you something right there. Very good canvases, but ask them to stretch them extra tight. It's well worth it. I have a hard time getting detailed distant tree leaves. Any tips? Well, as far as distant trees go, you can pretty much go with the filbert brush, the one inch brush, or the fan brush. I think maybe the fan brush would be the easiest. Here's what I would do. I would like just, <laughs> here's my palette, right? You would just crunch it into your palette, not too much paint, and then you kind of just stipple and then move it, the brush around, you know, a little circle like that, just stippling. It should give you a pretty quick and easy tree. Um, use soft colors with blue tones. I think maybe the biggest problem if you're talking about background elements is having too much paint in the background. Be sure you're removing some of that with a shop towel because there's no amount of, you know, proper brush stroke that's ever going to give you a nice effect if you're working on a, a background that has too much paint. You'll just get mud. Do you paint on any surfaces besides canvases? I actually have in the past, but very rarely. I've painted on masonite, which is a really good alternative if you're not interested in the, um, the rough texture of a canvas. Uh, if you want it to be really smooth, masonite's a pretty good choice. A couple layers of gesso, probably a good idea. Plus, you can cut them to whatever size you want. and They're super available, very readily available, no matter what part of the world you're in. All right, the next question, it says, hi, Kevin. Hi. <laughs> oh boy. Is it possible to create misty effects with acrylics without using foundation medium? Well, it definitely is. I think the trick, the foundation medium is nice and you know, I like to use that to help blend my colors, especially like in the background, I'll add it. But the real trick isn't the foundation medium so much as it is the round brush that uh, the custom tapered round, it's cut. Uh, it's a very sharp cone shaped, right? Because normally brushes are pretty long. This one's a cone shaped and um, that helps. You use the side of the brush and it's a very nice dry brush blending brush and it, it gives you a softer effect. So that's kind of the secret to blending acrylics. I definitely recommend dry brush blending uh, with the custom tapered round brush. Is there anything that we need to add to the canvas before we start painting? I like to start out with a mix of titanium white and gambling clear gel. But it's also worth mentioning here that I don't add any medium to the foreground elements or even the background, just the sky only. I find when you add medium to the foreground, it just makes everything more difficult. All right, next question here. I don't see a one or two inch brush for acrylic painting on your website. Any alternatives? So the acrylic flat blender is two inches across. It's super thin though. And I think it works better with the water and the thin acrylics, you know, versus having a really fat brush. So use the flat blender for backgrounds and that pretty much do everything that you need uh, as far as what a one and two inch brush would do in oil. That's pretty much your alternative there. What's a good way to learn to paint? Should I do the whole painting or specific elements? This may be the best question of the day. I personally like to start with the elements. In fact, we've got several technique series DVDs in both oil and acrylic because I think there's, it's so important to learn these techniques. I've watched people learning you know, struggle because they are not able to paint a mountain and a tree and they're trying to come up with the subject and, and all the complicated parts like fitting a landscape together, you know? 
and they still can't paint a tree. I mean, that's just, that's hard and that's difficult and frustrating, honestly. And there's no reason to be frustrated with that. It's far better. Now, I'm not saying let's not get out and do full paintings. Definitely do full paintings when you're learning, but focus more on the elements. Because once you learn the elements, painting becomes more fun. You know, once you can paint any kind of tree that you like, it becomes more of a creative process and less of a, ooh, I don't know what I'm doing here process. You know what I mean? So hopefully that helps. When you were beginning, how often do you practice painting or is it more like leisure? Well, that's a good question. It's been a little while. It's been like, oh, I started painting when I was 15, so I don't know. It's been a long time. I think it was more for, for fun in the beginning, you know, just kind of for leisure, you know, and I got excited. I do remember getting excited about it. You know, I had a mountain. It was a terrible mountain, but I liked it at the time. It was good and it made me excited and I wanted to paint more. And of course, the next one that you do is not necessarily better, but eventually it does get better. And so I think it was more just for fun. And I recall, I, here we go, we're gonna go way back. I recall getting my first commission painting and I was not very old. And I got paid a couple hundred bucks for it, which at the time was amazing. Like the moment, you know, I've never had that much money in my hand at once. And, and it kind of, that kind of got me excited in a different way. In a, wow, there's, there's a possibility to make a living off of this. And so then I kind of maybe started exploring a little more, a little more in depth, you know, a little more seriously. And I certainly would practice more regularly in that time frame too. It was definitely a lot of practicing, you know. This next question is very specific, but I think that this could be helpful to quite a few people. What colors do you mix and highlight rocks in the sunny morning? It's like a sun, sunrise or sunset colors on rocks, yellow ochre, a little bit of red and titanium white. Maybe a touch of umber if you want to, you don't really have to. And I would grab the detail round, lots of paint, more paint than brush, you've heard me say that before, and layer it on super, super thick so that it's bright and vibrant and just beautiful. Make sure, and then you probably have some sort of an orange, like a yellow ochre red, kind of as your back tone, as your mid tone working back. That would work, that would look really good. So hopefully that helps. I wanna paint a sunset now. Is it necessary to use both linseed oil and mineral spirits in an oil painting or could we use just one? I personally don't even have mineral spirits or, or paint thinner in the house at all and I haven't for years. I clean up my brushes with baby oil. It doesn't work as good. I'll be up just straight up front. It doesn't work as good. And it requires a lot of like taking the paper towel and just trying to wipe the brushes out and then kind of rinsing them in the baby oil and then rubbing them again. And then as far as thinning your paint, you just do that with a little bit of linseed oil from the art store, you know, for the liner brush would be, be about the only thing you would probably want to thin the paint for, maybe um, flicking the little rocks on the road, something like that. Uh, regular linseed oil from the art store works great for that. All right, I think you're gonna like this next question. This is a, this is a very deep question. How do you paint clouds? <laughs> and if you've ever tried to paint a cloud, or if, you, if you've learned how to paint clouds, it's, I understand why you're asking the question. Uh, it's just practicing, practicing the right way, absorbing the paint away, you know, taking the paint off the background, you know, wiping it with a shop towel, wiping the blue sky so you can get your white clouds over without them becoming blue also, right? That would be, that would be a quick tip that might help. But as far as learning, I think the best thing to do is go ahead and, and get the DVD or digital download of our techniques on clouds. It's going to at least help propel you kind of to learn the clouds a little faster. But just sit down with a canvas and filbert brush, just scrub in different in different shapes and patterns and then blend them, especially toward the bottom. Leave the top a little more sharp and, and practice that way. Just see what happens. You might stumble into some techniques that really click. The next one is, I can't paint trees like you do and make them look natural. Any suggestions? So trees are another thing you probably should be practicing um, on just a canvas, just trees all over the place. And we've got lessons for that as well if you need that. But maybe the most important thing to look at when you're painting a tree is you want a very pleasing, a very rough, what's that proper word? A very organic shape to the tree. You know, you don't want it to be too symmetrical where it's like a lollipop or just like several branches that all kind of look the same. And the other thing to look for is negative space in your tree. Holes where you can see the sky shining through. Those things are very important. Those couple of tips to kind of look for those things may help improve your trees quite a bit. All right, this next question, how do you sell a painting to a friend or family member? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think I have a video 
uh, you can go back and look at that talks about how to sell your paintings online. But as far as selling to a family member, um, be open to commission paintings. Everybody wants something special, their family house or their favorite vacation spot. And you know, whether it's family or friends or strangers, custom paintings are usually the way to go if you're trying to make a sale. All right, I like this next one, I really do. <laughs> do you have any composition rules or tips? I love that, art rules. I, I don't have any art rules at all. I kind of just wing it. <laughs> But that's okay. I think I get a better result. For me personally, um, is my composition perfect all the time? Absolutely not. Does it break rules that I don't even know exist? Probably. But if you're going to, as a general tip, keep things kind of not symmetrical. If you've got a, you can put trees in the middle and that's kind of a stylistic thing. But if you're going to just say you want a tip, keep things kind of off central, center and not symmetrical. And it's kind of nice to keep things like large trees leading into the painting, you know what I mean? And then and same with mountains, kind of mountains coming into the painting is a good thing. But as far as composition, just make it as natural and nothing repetitive as possible. Now this is interesting. I don't think I've seen this question before anywhere, but it is something that, that happens. Why do some oil paints take so much longer to dry? So you are talking about white and about yellow. Sap green takes forever to dry. I don't know. I should probably ask. I personally haven't looked into it. I'm not sure the actual science as to why it dries more slowly versus the something like a, a burnt umber. You put that on your palette, it seems like you turn around and it's dry. It really dries so fast. I'm not sure why that happens, but it definitely happens. It's not something that's wrong with your paint. I think it happens to just about every brand. They have different colors dry at different rates. We're talking oil paints here. That's not so much true for acrylics. Um, that's good. That's interesting. I don't know why. Never, I never really thought to look into it. Are you still enjoying painting today as much as you did when you started? Very, very interesting question. I, I think I might be enjoying it more because you guys, because of you guys, because you guys make it fun. Because now there's somebody to show my paintings to, you know? So it's kind of exciting. And when I pick stuff out, it's not like, I wonder what I want to paint today. I kind of, I, I really do. I look at what I've posted recently. I haven't done this in a while, or I wonder if people want to see that. It's kind of interesting. It's a different way to think about it, but that's kind of what goes through my mind. Uh, and, and I think I have more fun with it now, which is crazy because I've been doing it for so long, but it, it's so much fun. I enjoy all of the different aspects that go along with it because at this point it's a little bit more than just painting. So this next one, is it necessary to varnish an oil painting? And if so, when would you do that? So I have varnished two paintings, maybe? It's not a bad idea. It adds that layer of protection. But I think on most of the varnish brands, like on the can, they, they tell you to wait about six months to 12 months. And that's a very long time to wait. Um, so I don't usually do it. You could certainly do it and it might be a good idea to protect the actual painting. I definitely follow the instructions on the can. Uh, you can use a spray varnish. I think I know a lot of artists that use the spray varnish and it works out pretty well for them. So that's what I used too in the past. Works pretty well. How do you compose an intriguing composition that's not too busy? So that kind of goes back to pre-planning your paintings. You need some sort of a plan whether it's you're copying you know, a painting that I've done, or you're copying a photo that you've taken, or if you're sitting down with a pen and a paper and saying, my mountain goes here, my tree goes there, whatever your preferred method of figuring out where you're gonna go, start there. Don't start on the canvas, it doesn't end well. But my thought is, you know, figure out what you're doing first. Look at that reference image, whatever you've got, and, and Ask yourself, you know, is it busy? Where does your eye go? Does your eye go to the middle? Does it go flying off the edge and onto the wall? You want your eye to be held in the middle of the painting, your center of interest. And if you make it too busy, you'll notice. It'll be like, whoa, 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 whoa. And, and you won't be able to just like look at your image and enjoy it. And that's why a reference idea is so important. That's where a good painting starts. Do you paint with watercolor? I've done a couple of watercolor paintings. I don't think I've actually ever filmed one, which is probably a good thing. You probably don't want to see me fumble <laughs> with watercolor painting. It is different, and the people who do it are really good at it, and it takes a different kind of, a different operation, order of operations a little bit, so I haven't quite figured that out fully. I can watercolor paint, but I definitely fumble around with it, and it's not something I'm gonna be filming anytime soon. 
do your paintings always turn out exactly how you wanted in the end? Not always. No, of course not. Sometimes I struggle and sometimes, you know, the liner brush saves the day sometimes at the end. So definitely I like to wait if I can, even if I'm not super happy with it and try to detail it out. Sometimes that's all it needs is just a, a long time with the liner brush. <laughs> it makes it look so much better. But sometimes I'm just not as pleased. And every once in a while, it just doesn't turn out right for whatever reason. Sometimes you can go back and fix it. Sometimes it's worth just saying, I learned from this experience, I'm gonna do better next time. And that's okay. It's not a failure at all if things don't work out and you wanna just start again. I do that every so often, not super common, a couple times a year, just depending. It's okay to start over if you need to, or just start a different subject altogether. All right, this is a good question. Can you make a similar painting twice? The answer is I, yes, and I do it all the time because uh, I don't know how many people actually know this, but the, the YouTube videos that you're used to seeing here are filmed separately from my DVD lessons or download lessons that are available on the website for two reasons. Number one is this is the first time I've ever painted the painting when I do it you know, on YouTube. So you know, whatever last week was, that was the first time I ever painted that, never done it before. And so a lot of it is I'm kind of, and you see it, some of it, is I'm, I'm going on the fly. I'm changing things up like, oh, tree over here. I changed my mind, tree over here, mountain here, making the mountain bigger. All those crazy things that I do, um, just creating the painting. But that is not a good way to learn. And I can't teach you while I'm doing that. It's just, it would drive you crazy and it wouldn't be a good experience. So what I have to do is I have to repaint it. And this time, because I know where I'm going, I can structure it like an actual lesson. So I'm giving you an art lesson when I paint it again for the DVD. And it's full length, not skipping anything. And it saves a lot of time because I can paint faster when I know where I'm going. Whereas for the actual YouTube videos, I don't know where I'm going as much. And it's more trial and error for the composition. Where do I want my trees? Where's my light going? I'm changing this, moving this around and just making it the way that I want it. And then just bringing you guys along for the process to hopefully kind of get you inspired and then you do your version, it's all fun. But that's one circumstance where I'm painting the same painting twice. When you start painting, how do you gauge how much to sell your paintings for? So I did a video not too long ago about how to kind of price your paintings to sell online, but just a quick, just a quick overview. Uh, set your price at you know whatever you want. We'll just say 100 bucks, just for the sake of picking a number. And you sell one, raise the price, sell one, raise the price until you don't sell anymore, lower the price a little, and there is your selling price, at least for the near future. I can't take full credit for that. A good friend of mine actually told me how to do that. How do you blend acrylics without them drying so quickly? Good question. Personally, I like to just let them dry. You know, get your sky in as best you can, as fast as you can, and then let it dry. And then use dry brush blending, which really, um, you know, the paint underneath is dry, the paint in your brush obviously is wet, <laughs> and you just scrub it on, and you just allow it to be transparent, and that's your blend. It's way easier than trying to race against the clock. So what's better to start with, oils or acrylic? I've actually got some videos, a couple of videos, showcasing, you know, hey, here's oil and here's acrylic, and do the same scene on, like, two sides of the can, you know, one each side of the canvas. <laughs> Hopefully that video will help you see which, maybe which one you like better, because they just, they have different, different advantages. Acrylics are definitely easier to get going with. You don't have to have so much supply or it's not so messy. You know, it's, you clean them up with water. It's super easy. Oil's not quite as easy for the setting up and the clean. And then you got your wet painting. Where do you put your wet painting for a week? Make sure it's good and dry or two weeks, whatever it takes for the whites to dry. And the acrylic paintings, you, you're done. They dry for five minutes, you put them in the corner and you can start the next one. It just depends. How much space do you have to, to dedicate to your painting? Also kind of goes into, into that as well. Now this one's interesting. I don't think I've ever had one of these on a Q&A before. It's a great question because it's, it's kind of got a double answer. Is there a special time of day that you prefer to paint? Day, evening, night? There used to be. And, and I found the last, I was just talking about this the other day, within the last six months or less, I've noticed that change. So it used to be morning, and for years it used to be morning. In fact, I would say if I don't get a good start in the day, I'm just not gonna paint today. It's not worth it. My mind just didn't fire as good in the afternoon. And I've noticed that changing over the last, like I said, about six months. And it could be because I have a two-year-old <laughs> and it's enough to make anybody's mind change. Um, I find that I can paint any time of the day now. 
whether that's at night after dinner or in the morning. In fact, it's, it's been later. Um, I'm not too sure why that's happening, but it's interesting. It used to be only morning and now I kind of, I'll paint whenever it just, uh, I don't care. Very interesting. The highlight layers don't stick over the base paint. What should I do? This is like my number one thing is get the paint off the canvas. It's not your friend. Take a shop towel, get rid of it. You can highlight right over it. That's the number one secret to oil painting without mud. Some people don't have money for the full lessons. What can they do? So I've got a couple of videos that I've done live stream. So it's, it is the entire painting process. Nothing skipped. They're not usually the most intense paintings in the world, but you, have, you get an idea of each step, all my brush strokes, all my colors. And if you're not able to get the DVDs, that would be a great way to learn. Just search um, on my channel, just search live stream. There should be several paintings. They're usually about an hour or more long. Have you ever tried painting in a different style? And if so, can you see? So I haven't done a lot of like completely different styles. As far as subjects, sometimes I'll do something kind of out of left field, like, uh, <laughs> you know, here we are doing a, a cookie and milk today or something just random because I want to. But most of the time, it's kind of just the same, even those are kind of similar style, a similar technique. Um, as far as doing something completely different, not so much. Kind of just stick to, to this because I know you guys enjoy it and I don't know that I would be necessarily good at something completely different. Um, trying to kind of just stick to this. Which brand of oil paint do you use? I use Gamblin 1980 paints. You can get those on the website. How in the world do your skies not turn out as a green mess? <laughs> well, I'm guessing you're talking about sunsets. Two things. Wiping, you know, wiping your canvas off if you know you're going to have those colors kind of get close. And the other thing, having a nice red layer in, in between your yellow and blue. That's probably the best thing you can do to keep that a little bit, a little bit more safe. But I understand the, the biggest problem is generally too much paint on the canvas. All right, the next question. Why does my oil paint dry dull in color? You shouldn't, your colors shouldn't be shifting. You know, you're, you're especially your oil paints. What you see is what you get with oil paint. And if that's not happening for you, uh, change to 1980 Gamblin paints. That will fix the problem. However, if maybe what you're saying is you're, you're like losing that shine. And you do lose a little bit of shine when they dry. They dry a little more flat, which is usually a good thing because you can see them from different angles. But if you want that shine back, then you need to varnish your paintings with a glossy varnish once they're completely dry, following the instructions on the can, right? <laughs> Why do you put a shop towel across your painting? So yeah, that's pretty funny. If you're not, <laughs> if you haven't been here a long time, that, that's pretty random, I know. It's to absorb the loose paint that's sitting on top. And you're literally kind of drying out the paint underneath by removing that oil into the shop towel. And that way I can highlight without creating kind of a muddy mess. It really makes things so much easier to get that detail. What goes into your decision making on what paintings you will make into full length DVDs versus which ones you won't? So a lot of that is actually your input. Ideally, I wish every painting that I do could be a full length lesson, but it, may, it requires me filming it again and teaching it, you know, in a way that you could learn from and wouldn't drive you absolutely nuts. So I try to pick the ones that you guys are asking for the most and also which ones I feel like would make a good lesson and there'd be something to learn. But most of the time it's your input that lets me know which one I'm gonna do next. I'd love some tips on getting the right perspective with landscape paintings. So we've covered a lot about composition, but not so much about perspective. And to get a good, to get a good perspective, you've got, you kind of have two options. Like, do you want to be up on a cliff looking across your landscape, or do you want to be more sitting on a rock or standing kind of in the foreground? If you put your horizon, we'll say way at the top of the canvas. So you've got this much, this much sky, and then this much land it's going to look as though you are either looking down or you are going to be standing on a cliff and you're going to see a drop off and you're going to see a valley on the other side. Now, if you want to do something where you're standing looking across a lake, for instance, you would bring that horizon line way lower. So you got this much sky and this much land, and that would make it look, you know, it would make everything look what's called foreshortened, which really means like flattened. That's foreshortened, flattened. I'm looking at a monitor here, <laughs> flat looking, you know, this is like flat, like you're looking across a valley, and that's foreshortened. I don't know if any of that makes any sense. But if you're, you lower that horizon, and it'll make it appear as though you're just standing at eye level, just looking across something that's fairly flat. And the way that you can, the way that you can mess this, the only way to mess this up would be if you're painting something like a lake, 
and you put that horizon really, really high. That wouldn't look, it wouldn't look correct unless you bring some foreground elements in to make it look like there's a cliff. It'll just, it'll just look weird, <laughs> especially if your grass is really small in the foreground. You can kind of get away with it if your grass is really tall or you have large foreground elements because then again, it looks like you're looking more down and you're just seeing what's above, you know what I mean? Hopefully that makes sense. Where you place that horizon line completely changes the way a painting feels. This is an interesting next question. Do you use a mother color, which is, uh, it's like a, a color mixed with, it's like several colors mixed together and then you take that color and you add that to everything. Uh, going forward in your painting. Pretty sure I remembered that right. It's been a long time since I've even looked at that. Uh, yeah, to promote color harmony um, so that your colors don't clash. I kind of use it, which is funny because it's I don't use it, but I mix paint on top of paint, which is doing a similar thing where I'm like, okay, I'm going to mix up a green for this tree, but I'm going to mix it up over my sky color or over my water color, and I just go right over the same color, and then I'm going to highlight and I'll pull a little of that color in and kind of mix or use that dirty brush. So without the effort of thinking, <laughs> hey, here's the structure, you know, I'm gonna do it this way, just inherently by mixing paint over paint, you do actually make a painting that, that is a little more harmonized with the colors. You know, they don't, man, I should turn my phone down. <laughs> so they don't clash. So yeah, it, sort of, mix paint over paint is what I do. I'd love to see a dog portrait. I've done one, <laughs> just one. Uh, I think it's, it's a video, you can go back and search it. I, th I think it is, I think it's Pet Portrait or something like that is the title. So definitely go check it out. I am not a dog painter, but I, I did my best. Do you have any tips for drawing shapes for roads or paths coming into the foreground? I want to do better at this. So as far as, as, far as the roads are concerned, the main thing, they're really tiny in the back and they need to, we'll just say, pick an S shape, whatever shape you want. Do like an S shape, but they need to quickly widen. And as far as in the in the foreground, a general rule of thumb would be make them like two-thirds of the canvas width. Unless you want it to just look like a little footpath. Two-thirds of the canvas at the at the bottom and they can quickly taper off as they go back. And then the other thing, I like to make my paths look recessed. So bushy grass and then your brush strokes literally are kind of banana shaped to make that look a little more recessed. Hopefully that helps. Paths are, can be a little tricky with perspective sometimes, but super small in the background and they just flare way bigger at the foreground. It should give you a nice effect. You should be able to look like you're walking down the road. The other thing, smooth, smooth highlights in the background and then kind of chunkier in the, in the mid-ground and then foreground. I'm usually flicking paint to give myself those little sharp, crisp details. That helps a little bit too. Well, that's about all the time we have for these questions today. There were so many really good questions, so we'll definitely have to revisit another Q&A video soon. Don't forget to check out our website, DVDs, and Brushline. Thanks for watching. <laughs>